Greetings, respective viewers. I am George from Ireland. I'm on Ebury Street in London, and I'm standing in front of the house where F.E. Smith lived for the last uh, 10 years or so of his life. So, Frederick Edwin Smith was born in 1872 in Liverpool, uh, the son of a barrister. And uh, by the 1920s, um, F.E. Smith had been uh, raised to the peerage. He'd been elevated to the title of Earl of Birkenhead, because Birkenhead is that small, well, not small town, that big town, uh, just across the River Mersey from Liverpool, where he spent most much of his childhood. He'd been to school there, Birkenhead School. And he later went up to the University of Liverpool, which was, was very newly founded in those days. So, although his father was at the bar, if you wanted to make serious money, then as now, you had to be in London. So, his father did reasonably well by the standards of the Liverpool bar, but wasn't uh, doing that well on a national scale. Anyway, F.E. Smith was a precociously talented lad, and he decided that the University of Liverpool wasn't good enough for him. So, after a year, he transferred to Oxford University. From a current perspective, it might seem surprising they went to Wadham College. Um, Wadham um, is very much as they said, the far left. People used to call it the People's Republic of Wadham, or uh, it had a very um, out gay culture, say as far back as the 1980s, when that was really not the done thing, uh, known as Sodom. Well, and, and until 1972, it had a, a master called Morris Bowra, who was widely known to be homosexual, even at a time when that was illegal. But anyway, we're going back, uh, we're going back to about 1900, when F.E. Smith went up to Wadham, and it didn't have these um, uh, far left associations. It was one of the less fashionable Oxford colleges, only founded in the 17th century, so perhaps easier for someone who wasn't quite so well connected to get in. I had no difficulty passing the uh, admissions exam, uh, responsio responsiones as it's called, in Latin, ancient Greek, and maths. Might seem curious, you actually didn't have to pass an exam in English. That was assumed, which made it slightly easier for undergraduates from other countries such as Germany to come, although there are very few um, overseas, uh, overseas undergraduates back then. If they were, they're from um, colonies. Anyhow, F.E. Smith, he was elected president of the Oxford Union, and only a minority of people joined the Oxford Union back then. It was the debating society of Oxford University, but outside the auspices of the proctors, as in people in charge of, of discipline, so they could debate whatever they want. So uh, that's where he honed his uh, debating skills. He was noted for his pugilistic uh, style and his razor-sharp wit, and this, this uh, rapier intellect of his was something he would deploy to devastating effect in the courtroom in many cases. So uh, he then was called to the bar, and really since his earliest childhood, that had been clear that that was his ambition. And he came uh, to the bar in London, and he prospered quite soon. So in those days, uh, obviously you, they were doing the bar vocational course, reading for the bar, and um, had to pay for that. No student loans, no grants in those days. There were a handful of scholarships. I don't know if you got one, actually. And then you had to pay to do pupillage, as it was an assistant to someone who's an established barrister. These days, you get paid to do it. You go back to the mid-90s, you were paid zilch, but you didn't have to pay. But his time, you actually had to pay to do it. So unless you're from quite a well-off family, it just wasn't going to happen. And even then, to make it to the bar, you either needed to be exceptionally talented or else know the right people. And, well, with him, it was, it was, it was the former. So, uh, obviously, there were, there were a handful of barristers who were doing extraordinarily well, most of them doing quite well, but some of the younger ones were struggling. But uh, pretty soon, he was getting uh, lucrative briefs. Um, he was very, very involved in conservative politics, and uh, by the time he called, was called to the bar, the issue of Home Rule for Ireland came to the fore. Remember, the whole of Ireland, we were in the United Kingdom at the time, and um, he had set his face against that. So, Liverpool had a large Irish community, and indeed, the um, Irish Home Rule Party field of parliamentary candidates in Liverpool, um, one of whom was um, T.P. O'Connor, Tepe O'Connor, who was elected for the Scotland Road um, division of, of Liverpool, that's the, the northern section of the city, as in the road to Scotland. Um, and he was, he was returned at many elections right up until the 1930s when he died, you know, after the partition of Ireland. Anyhow, so it was quite a polarised city on this issue. The Orange Order was uh, prominent in Liverpool. I believe F.E. Smith was never a member. Frederick Edwin Smith, but he's always known as F.E. Smith. Um, anyhow, he was involved in Conservative party, party politics and managed to get himself elected to Parliament. Um, he was a confidant of, of Churchill. Even though Churchill um, went over to the Liberals, they still managed to maintain a cordial relationship uh, across the aisle. Now, F.E. Smith was a reactionary in some regards, and um, he was dead against extending the franchise to women. And in the Edwardian period, this was a, a pressing issue. 
should women have the right to vote in parliamentary elections? They already had the right to vote in local elections to the county council, to the city council. Indeed, they were permitted to stand as candidates, could be elected a city councillor. We would have said alderman in those days, even if it was a woman, alderman, could be elected to their um, city council or whatever, could even be mayor of their town. But he said, absolutely no, this is unthinkable. Anyway, um, he was soon appointed to cabinet rank. Remember, it was a liberal government, but from 1916 um, uh, on, there was a, a, a wartime coalition. And um, he was attorney general, he was solicitor general. Um, he'd replaced um, uh, uh, Edward Carson in that latter position. And he was, again, a close ally of Sir Edward Carson, the leader of the LC Unionists. Um, in 1916, Sir Roger Casement, an Irishman, he was in Germany and he was uh, cavorting with the Kaiser. Um, and he got, uh, went to prison war camps, Freisack camp, where Irish prisoners from the British Army were separated to try and persuade them to turn their coats against Ireland, or as he would say for Ireland, against the United Kingdom and to fight for Germany to split Ireland off from Great Britain. And of the thousands of Irishmen he interviewed, only 52 joined his side. Anyway, Roger Casement, he wanted German weapons and German officers. He got the former, not the latter, and he was sent on a uh, German ship disguised a Norwegian one off the coast of Ireland. I won't go through the whole sordid tale, but anyway, intercepted by the Royal Navy, and he was landed successfully at, um, at this, this uh, beach near, near Banner Strand, just north of Tralee, but uh, the Royal Navy intercepted the German warship carrying the 20,000 rifles and the Germans scuttled it rather than hand rifles over to the enemy. But Casement was arrested and he was signaling to the um, uh, Irish Republican Brotherhood and the Irish Volunteers, don't go ahead with the Easter Rising, 1916, but nevertheless they did. Anyway, Casement was charged with um, high treason. He was obviously giving aid and comfort to the King's foes in time of war. He'd been in Germany and um, he had conspired to bring German troops and German weapons to uh, start an insurrection uh, within the British Isles. So uh, as the government's lawyer, F.E. Smith prosecuted. I think it was, um, was it Sir Roger Casement or maybe it was George Bernard Shaw who said that uh, really it's all, all to be, it ought to be F.E. Smith is on trial for treason and not, and not on the Treasury bench, as in, you know, he's on the front bench in the House of Commons, because part of the cabinet. Because if you go back to um, um, 1912, when the Home Rule Bill was reintroduced, 1913, when the UBF was founded, F.E. Smith was one of those diehards saying, no, we certainly must have Home Rule for Ulster, all right, we might have to grudgingly accept it for the southern three provinces of Ireland, but founding the UBF is absolutely right, and the UBF would be entitled to take up arms against His Majesty's government rather than permit Home Rule to be introduced for the whole of Ireland. And uh, it seemed like a treasonous talk to many. Was that not sedition? But anyway, it wasn't prosecuted. Um, I actually agree the UBF shouldn't have been founded and there should have been all these threats. Um, even if I don't want Home Rule, and I don't, if it's passed, it must, simply must be accepted. That's that. Uh, the law is the law. Uh, it seemed bizarre that someone who prided himself in his constitutional character and being scrupulously law-abiding would openly advocate for such uh, flagrant br breaches of the law. Uh, so that was that. Sir Roger Casement w w was um, sent down. And it was actually the prosecution had um, revealed these black diaries. Roger Casement, when he'd been in the Congo exposing uh, terrible abuses against the Congolese and in Peru, he supposedly had kept this um, journal of his extraordinary uh, uh, voracious sexual appetites, homosexual appetites, his very varied life in that regard and all his appetites. And this was supposed to damn him. Are these real? Are they a hoax cooked up by uh, the prosecution? We don't know. But um, from them supposedly being discovered to them being issued with something like three weeks, and people say, well, they wouldn't have had time to produce this in three weeks, and there were several volumes of them. They couldn't have done this, and nothing's been proven to be false. I think all the dates and all the particulars have been um, verified. I, I, I don't know. I'm slightly minded to think they are real, actually. But it's meant to really damn Roger Casement, because then a reprieve campaign got going. Um, George Bernard Shaw writing in the Manchester Guardian that he ought not be topped and Casement saying, uh, quoting Jesus Christ in his defense, oh, well, he must be right then. Uh, you could quote Christ against him and uh, saying, oh, well, you know, loyalty lo rests on love and not re restraint. But wait a second, love would require you to be restrained, to not sometimes be angry or not walk out or whatever it is. Um, so it was obviously a false dichotomy he was positing there. And if he was introducing German troops into Ireland, we would not easily get them out again. And he had no authority to do this, and all sorts of reasons why it was high treason. But anyway, it didn't save him, and he was executed at Wandsworth Prison. His corpse later returned to Ireland in the late 60s by uh, Harold Wilson gave permission. 
buried, buried in Dublin, in, in, in um, I think it's Ooh. Where is it? Arbor Hill? I think it's not actually Glasnevin. And, and Wilson said that it mustn't be buried in Northern Ireland because that would just inflame sectarian tensions. But uh, so that was F.E. Smith. In the 1920s, he served in many other cabinet positions, such as Secretary of State for India. However, um, his uh, very heavy drinking was getting the better of him, and he was perhaps past his best. His cognitive faculties weren't what they once had been. He always had his eye on the top job, but that wasn't the case. He didn't have the aristocratic pedigree with the Conservative Party, which was almost sine qua non to achieve pearl position. Um, so there was the slump and imperial glory had faded somewhat. He was Secretary of State for India um, when uh, Congress party was agitating so much he had to do a double act with um, Lord Irwin, the Viceroy of India, who was later the Earl of Halifax. And Lord Irwin, his um, house is ooh, not very far away. It's not even half a mile in that direction. I wonder if they ever met here in London. But uh, so he was having to reluctantly accept that significant concessions had to be made to the Congress party to try and keep a lid on the situation, which is really not what he wanted to see because he thought this would be the beginning of the end, it would unravel the, the British Empire, which he believed so fervently. Um, anyway, so uh, he fell ill and died in 1930. He was cremated at Golders Green and his ashes were scattered in his, in his country house. I can't remember which one of the Midland counties it is, but uh, there we are near his constituency. So that's F.E. Smith, someone who deserves to be rather better known.